Well, since I do already have your attention, I guess I will start. That will give us more time to listen to Lauren Graham and to converse with him. So the first thing I have to do is convey regrets from Eleonora Gilbert, who woke up on Friday with a raging sore throat and has not has just been feeling horrible all weekend. So she was unable to make it today. She's very sorry about that. So what that meant for me was that yesterday I found out I was giving the opening remarks, <laughs> <laughs> and um, you'll have to forgive me if they're not quite as pristinely organized as I might have wished um, them to be. So I'll just start by saying how pleased I am that you're all here. Uh, I'm a relative outsider. I'm not a historian of Soviet science. Um, that's not even a hat that I think anyone in my department really imagines me wearing. <laughs> but I became curious about this field as I did work on um, the Soviet rest cure and ideas about the need for rest, etc., in the West and in the Soviet Union. And um, at the last ACs, I went around to a number of panels about Soviet science and scouted. I heard Diane, <laughs> Diane speak, and uh, I heard several people speak. And um, I, I began thinking about inviting people um, to speak, just uh, to give lectures on campus. And then it turned out that it became possible to actually organize a small conference, which we did on relative short notice. And so I'm appreciative, especially uh, to all those who were able to uh, arrange their schedules to come and join us and to, to prepare papers to deliver. Um, one thing I figured out, I was an outsider to this group, but, but they know each other very well. And I'm, I'm watching them this morning and seeing how uh, happy they are to see each other. And that's a very nice thing to see. So I'm glad to have given you the opportunity to get together. Again, I hope to maybe do that one more time. Uh, we'll talk about that at the end of the conference tomorrow. Um, to begin, I also just want to acknowledge the generous support of the Center for East European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, as well as the Stavanovich Institute on the Formation of Knowledge. They're serving as our host site today. And Ceres, the aforementioned group, has been absolutely essential. All of the speakers have been in contact with Esther and, and you've all been supported by the work of, of Matthew Wefflin, who's done a lot of work preparing everything. So um, this would not have been possible without the both the financial and logistical support of those people. So we often like to write the introduction to a book after it's completed, and it would be nice to do that, especially yesterday, finding out that I was doing this. I thought that would be nice uh, to do it on Tuesday instead of uh, tomorrow morning. But I will get things going by setting forth a couple of ideas that Soviet, Soviet science perpetuated about itself, and then some precepts that have been established by those working in the, on the history of Soviet science, including some who are in the room with us today. The title of the conference is a variation on the name of the Stavanovich Institute on the Formation of Knowledge. It places emphasis upon the idea of production and the relationship of science to industry, but also upon science as a kind of cultural production. The Bolshevik Academy had a scientific method, dialectical materialism, but also believed that under Soviet authority, material conditions were created that would produce greater collective knowledge and creativity. Gone were the social conditions that inhibited, partici inhibited participation of the lower classes in the scientific community. Gone were the baleful influences of capitalism which steered innovation in the direction of profit and toward the satisfaction of an unregulated market. A planned, rationalized economy would allow better coordination of science and industry. And just to illustrate briefly, um, well, the, the idea here, um, I'll go through just a couple of posters that I think um, show, in particular, this, this idea of a union between science and labor as a productive force. Um, this notion that when uh, the Soviets succeeded in, in sending the first person into space, that this was an achievement of Soviet science, but also of the, of the Soviet people, collectively. 
The right to an education guaranteed in the Constitution would lead to new successes in socialist culture and science. The union of science labor would guarantee new victories for communism. <coughs> this one speaks for itself, I think. But this person, um, a scientist, but who also maybe looks a bit like he's wearing some sort of military uniform. We'll leave it on that one. Um, George Medvedev argues that there's only one science, but there, because there's only one Earth, but there can be two so social sciences. He was speaking during the period of the Cold War, because on Earth there were two contrasting social systems. But in Science in Russia and the Soviet Union, Lauren Graham writes that the Russian Revolution, quote, presented not only a prescription for a different political and economic order, but also an alternative form of knowledge of the natural world. It called for a Marxist interpretation of nature, consciously opposed to existing bourgeois descriptions. We're interested today and tomorrow in exploring this alternate form of knowledge and then in the ways that the study of alternate models and methods might help us better understand how systems of scientific inquiry operate and perform. Alexei Kozhevnikov opens Stalin's Great Science, his book, by countering the claim of Karl Popper in 1950 that scientific progress depends very largely on political democracy. The worst decades of Stalin's rule, Kozhevnikov argues, were the period of, quote, the greatest progress in science and technology on Russian soil since the time of Peter the Great. That this success was achieved despite a repressive political system, ideological orthodoxy, and isolation from the international community is, for Kozhevnikov, quote, the main paradox of Soviet science. Nikolai Kremensov, who was also invited but couldn't attend today, writes compellingly of these paradoxes in his book, Stalinist Science. Outstanding achievement consisted routinely with backward doctrines, he writes. Membership in the Academy of Sciences was shared by brilliant scientists and ignorant political functionaries. Cutting-edge research was conducted in heavily funded science cities and in prison camps. Kremensov points out that practically all of the Soviet Nobelists received their awards during the years when arrests were common and the Gugulag camps overflowing. In facing this paradox, a, mo a moral paradigm is often deployed. If the political system was coercive, the science was compromised. But Kashevnikov argues that those intent upon demonstrating the detriment to science of Soviet politics have had to turn their attention away from the achievements to the weaknesses and failures of Soviet science. Some seized upon the Lysenko affair to connect, quote, the failures and problems of Soviet science and technology to the pernicious influences of politics and ideology while refusing to see the very same forces at work in the cases of achievements and triumphs. A more productive approach to the aforementioned episode is found in Lauren Graham's 2016 book, Lysenko's Ghost, a book that is appropriately about epigenetics rather than Stalinism. Despite the work of scholars like Lauren and Alexei, there's been a strong tendency to seek knowledge in Soviet failures rather than successes. What might be a more useful model for approaching this history? Let's take another example from Lauren Graham in What Have We Learned About Science and Technology from the Russian Experience? Lauren begins this book by clarifying that it is pr primarily about, not about Russia or the Soviet Union, but it is a study of science, making use of the Russian experience. His chapter titles illustrate the approach. Is science a social construction? Chapter one. Are science and technology westernizing influences? Chapter two. How robust is science under stress? How willing are scientists to perform, to reform their own institutions? In the last chapter, who should control technology? 
As we proceed over the next two days, we might ask ourselves what similarly scientific questions we can ask about the material we are examining. Such an approach will address the broad concerns of the Stevanovich Institute, but can also help us in the field of Soviet and Russian studies to do our work on the science and culture more productively. So now to my introduction of Lauren Graham. I've already been introducing him somewhat in my uh, introductory comments, but now I'll do so more directly. When you think of American historiography of Soviet science, the first name to come to mind is that of Lauren Graham. For over 50 years, he's written authoritatively about Soviet scientific achievements and failures and about systematic tendencies in both of these categories. He's one of those scholars whose work is so comprehensive that you feel anxiety for those coming in his wake. Will, the, will there be stones left unturned? Yes, is, yes I, I thought you might say that. I thought you might. Um, I'm still trying to figure out where they are. His education includes a BA in chemical engineering at Purdue University, a PhD in history from Columbia, and a year at, at Moscow State University in 1960-61 as part of an early Soviet-American academic exchange. His professional career began at Indiana User University, continued at Columbia, MIT, and Harvard, and included a very active practice of writing and mentoring. On the latter front, I know that he was instrumental in bringing Slava Girovich to work in the United States, and I just heard Senya Tatarchenko say something similar and I'm sure there are many others um, that we could say this about. He's served on the boards of the Soros Foundation, the Program on Basic Research in Higher Education, which supports the combination of research and teaching in Russian universities, and the U.S. Civilian Research and Development Foundation, which supports international scientific collaboration. He was a trustee of the European University at St. Petersburg and donated to the library of this institution several thousand books from his personal collection. In 1973, he was a finalist for the National Book Award for Science and Philosophy in the Soviet Union, and since that time, he's received many more accolades, including an honorary degree from Purdue University, the George Sarton Medal of the History of Science Society, and a medal from the Russian Academy of Sciences. His books have been published in 11 languages. In 1963, he co-authored a small publication on education and cybernetics based on a tour with Oliver Caldwell in the Soviet Union. Since then, he's published a truly impressive list of books, which form a small library, one that I have been exploring with the satisfaction you experience in the encounter with a great scholar. A recent acquisition is Between Science and Values, the cover of which confirms long-standing rumors that Andy Warhol was moonlighting at Columbia Uni University Press in the <laughs> early 1980s, but the content of which includes analysis of biomedical ethics and eugenics, which is the research theme of the Stefanovich Institute for this year and next. This is just another illustration of the breadth and depth of his work. He's taught us so much about the history of so Soviet science, but we're about to learn more. So I now invite Lauren Graham to begin. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for that over generous uh, introduction. I'd just like to say what a pleasure it is for me to be here, to see so many familiar faces, old friends. Uh, this is my milieu, and uh, I uh, appreciate the University of Chicago for giving me uh, that opportunity. Now, I know that this conference is about Soviet science, but what I'm going to talk about today is a problem that I think runs throughout Russian history, including the Soviet period. The problem that I'm going to discuss, I call it a riddle. The riddle that I'm going to discuss uh, is common to all three periods of those uh, of Russian history, and I can see it at work right now. So it's both a historical issue and a contemporary one. So what is this riddle of Russian creativity, the riddle 
of Russian creativity that I wish to talk about. Russian creativity presents us with this fascinating riddle that I wish to illustrate and explain. Why does Russian creativity express itself so brilliantly in some areas but not in others? Just think of the contributions that Russians have made to fields such as literature, music, poetry, mathematics, enormous contributions. The names Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Tchaikovsky, Prokofiev, Lobachevsky, Komogorov, and Alexeyevich, that last name may not be so well known to you, but she received, received the, recently received the Nobel Prize uh, for Literature, uh, although she's actually a, a journalist, but a brilliant journalist. So these are areas where Russian creativity uh, cannot be doubted. It should be celebrated. But it's a different story when one looks for successes in commercial technology in Russia. Just when have you gone into an electronics store and seen something that you were interested in and turned it over and seen made in Russia on the back? Probably never. It's difficult to think of a single Russian or Soviet technical innovation that was successful on the international commercial markets. Well, maybe you think hard you can find one, but it's very difficult. Russia is therefore interestingly unique in the unevenness of the fruits of its creativity. And this uniqueness, by the uniqueness I mean the brilliant achievements in some fields, but not in others, it calls for explanation, it seems to me, by intellectual historians of Russia. Russian creativity in abstract thought and the arts, what do I mean by abstract arts, thought, and the arts? Literature, music, poetry, mathematics, drama, theoretical physics. Russian creativity in these areas has found public expression, recognition, and success much more often than creativity in technology. The more the Russian creative effort was expressed in ideas recorded on paper, blackboard, canvas, or the internet, what do I mean there? Manuscript texts, equations, musical scores, paintings, verses, scripts, formula, drawings, computer programs, the more that Russian creativity was expressed in these forms, the more successful it was in finding expression and recognition both nationally and internationally. On the other hand, the more the creative effort was in material objects, new manufacturing processes, or machines, the more difficult it was for that creativity to find success, particularly in international markets. All this is true despite the fact that Russian governments, czarist, Soviet, post-Soviet, are infamous for trying to control ideas through censorship or propaganda 
not for restricting new inventions. What stopped Russian inventions from success was not overt prohibition, but the characteristics of Russian society. The fault here is not a failure in engineering or in, or in science. In other words, the Russian problem is not the absence of Russian technical creativity, but instead the absence of the successful use of that creativity. In fact, Russians were just as creative technologically as Russian novelists, poets, composers, and mathematicians were in ideas. In almost all the forms of modern technology so important to the world today, for example, electric lights, radio, airplanes, television, transistors, computers, lasers, rockets, space vehicles, in almost all those fields, Russian pioneers either led the way in strict priority terms, or were equal to or barely behind competitors elsewhere. However, unless that creativity was backed by a state or military program which ignored the factors which make for commercial success, the creativity of these Russian engineers and inventors was overwhelmingly blocked by obstacles in their environment. They almost universally failed to bring their potential innovations to international markets and their names usually fell into oblivion. The clarity of this pattern can be seen in the difficulty of finding a Russian invention that became a commercial success internationally. There are exceptions, but most of those exceptions are of Russians who emigrated abroad and succeeded in different environments. Zvarikin, Sikorsky, Durov. I mean, I could talk about each one of these, but... If all that a creative person in Russia had to do in order to fulfill his or her idea was simply to make it known through publication, performance, or exhibition, that person had a chance for fame. If the fulfillment of that idea, that person's idea, was a complex matter in which publication or appearance was a first inadequate or even unnecessary step, the chances for success for that person were much smaller. For a brilliant inventor, publication of an idea is easy, but grossly short of its fulfillment. Publication might, in fact, be an obstacle to ownership of that idea. For a, bril for a brilliant literary author or mathematician, on the other hand, publication is very nearly the culmination of his or her efforts. That difference has tremendous significance. The difference between what happens after an inventor presents something to the public and a writer or composer does the same thing is crucial for understanding the unevenness of Russia's successful creativity. A new technology at the moment of first presentation is usually much more imperfect than a work of art or literature. 
it almost always is incomplete. Even unsuccessful, calling for improvement in later years. An anecdote about the scientist Michael Faraday illustrates this feature of the first steps of a successful technology. When he developed a primitive dynamo, he reputedly was asked, what is it good for? And we are told that he replied, what is a newborn baby good for? New technology developed by Russians, some of it brilliant, often died as a newborn baby without ever growing up. No one was interested in or took proper care of that baby and the materials and means necessary for that care were often unavailable. The fact that a new technology is usually presented, first presented to the public in a much more unfinished form than is the case with a new work of art has many, many implications. Since the new technology Technology must be further invested in, researched, improved, legally protected, manufactured, successfully marketed, and integrated with existing technology. It is much more dependent on social infrastructure than is a piece of art. Art demands appreciation by at least a small group of cognoscenti. Technology demands much more. Where are the people who will see its potential and invest in further research? Who will improve it after that research? Who will defend it legally against competitors domestically and internationally? And what chance will these defenders have in a corrupt legal system? Who will pay for all of these investigatory engineering, legal, and economic steps? Who will manufacture it? Who will advertise it? Who will integrate it into existing technological systems? A new technology is usually disruptive the integration into an existing systems is not easy. Art usually does not face, by art I mean art broadly stated, art usually does not face such obstacles, but technology does. And in a country such as Russia, which is deficient in such infrastructures, especially those involving investment, legal, manufacturing, and economic issues, taking a new technology from newborn status, from newborn status to adult readiness for the market is particularly difficult. In many cases, such a transition did not occur in Russia. And when I say Russia here, I mean Tsarist Russia, Soviet Russia, and today's Russia. Although it should have for the good of the country and for the good of the inventor. A striking example of this kind of failure can be found in the development of television. The Russian originator of a basic idea in this field, Boris Rosing, was blocked in bringing that idea to fruition in Russia. But his student, who worked with him on that, Vladimir Zvorikin succeeded magnificently with his teacher's idea in the United States where he became a vice president of RCA and introduced the first commercially successful television uh, in, in the United States. There are many other examples. I wish I had time here to go through some of them, but I'll just rip off a few of them. 
Schilling and his telegraph before Morse. But Deegan and his light bulb, incandescent light bulb, before Thomas Edison. Butterdeen and his method of aldol condensation, pointing to industrial applications before the Germans who invented and the, the modern chemical industry on the basis of that. The largest chemical in, uh, company in the world today, BASF, a German company, started as a dye-making company using a method developed by a Russian. Popov and his radio before Marconi. Shukov and his method of petroleum cracking before Standard Oil. Losef and his primitive transistors and diodes before IBM and AT&T. And there are many other examples that can be taken from the history of Russian and Soviet technology. These technologies could not succeed in the country in which they originated. in which their originators worked. When the Russian Sergei Sikorsky did finally succeed with his aviation technology in the United States, and by the way, it was airplanes, not helicopters, did succeed with his aviation technology in the United States, he wrote a book in which he cited as the cause of his success the new political, economic, and social environment in which he was working after emigration. He built his first airplane in Kiev. <laughs> he also built the first four-engined passenger plane in the world, in St. Petersburg. Nothing came of them. There are many reasons why Russian writers, composers, poets, and mathematicians had and have an easier time fulfilling their dreams than inventors and entrepreneurs. The adequate infrastructure in Russia is important, but only one. An equally important reason is the elusive but basic attitudes prevalent in Russian society. That's a hard one to pin down, but I think it's very important. Artistic intellectuals are valued more in Russia than are inventors and entrepreneurs as reflected in Russian literature extending back several centuries. Again, I can't, I don't have time to give examples, but if you look at the writings of Dostoevsky and Turgenev, Saltikov Shedrin, many others, what is the image of the businessman in that literature? He is crude. He is materialistic. He's avaricious. He is selfish. He is Philistine. When artists or authors suffer in Russia, many of their fellow citizens sympathize with them and convert them into heroes or even martyrs. Oppression and censorship often raise their prominence <laughs> and increase the number of people trying to read, view, or listen to their works. When inventors, and I mean, I could give so many examples, but you all know Russia, I think you can spy some yourself, but uh, people like uh, uh, Boris Pasternak, uh, look, I hope it's not terrible to say that he probably wouldn't have received the Nobel Prize if he hadn't been so oppressed. When inventors and entrepreneurs suffer, on the other hand, 
few sympathizers can be found. Individual practical achievements are rarely objects of public adoration in Russia. Should a rare entrepreneur be successful and become wealthy, that feat is often a cause for suspicion or resentment. There's an old Russian proverb that says, if you, you can't sell anything unless you, unless you deceive. Yep. Uh, uh, the celebration of beleaguered authors and the disregard of equally beleaguered inventors are characteristics of Russian society. After the disappearance of the Soviet Union, the newly rich oligarchs were suspected, in many cases correctly, of criminality. The self-made man was not a hero, but a person who illegally and maliciously manipulated the system to his advantage. There are few or no Horatio Algiers in Russian literature or traditions. Sadly, many of the obstacles to the fulfillment of creativity, both in the arts and in technology, but especially technology, that were observable in Tsarist and Soviet Russia, are still present in Russia today. And there are even some new ones. Both the author and the inventor need to worry about government policy as they work. Just look at, uh, well, both of them are today dependent on the permission of the government or its leader for support. And that government and leader have their own criteria about whom deserves their approval. Many entrepreneurs and business people have, been a recently, have recently been arrested, including promising innovators. The New York Times recently uh, had an article with the title Quote, Russia wants innovation, but is arresting its innovators, unquote. Dmitry Popov, a serial entrepreneur who came to the United States in 1914, commented, quote, And for the last year in Russia, I was just absorbing the total deterioration of the business environment everything was becoming so bad." Unquote. Now as a historian, many of my examples of Russian technical brilliance followed by commercial failure come from the past. But let me conclude by giving, giving, by giving an example that is very recent. In fact, it affects the technology that you are probably carrying in your pocket right now. The story of the Russian scientist Jarez Alfyorov, who just died a few months ago, is illustrative here. A Nobel Prize winner, he was a co-inventor of an important but to the public underappreciated technology called heterojunction transistors. They are used in a multitude of ultra-fast electronic circuits. An example of their application close to the normal consumer is in smartphones which carry which require fast and efficient circuits operating at normal room temperatures. Heterotransistors can do this. They differ from the older transistors 
by incorporating a junction, a heterojunction, of two dissimilar crystalline semiconductors. Older transistors used only one type of semiconductor, what was called a homo uh, junction. Heterotransistors permit a wider spectrum of manipulation by electrical engineers to achieve very specific effects. At what point in time would it have been correct to judge this invention a success? It was certainly by 2000, by the year 2000, a personal success for Alfiorov. Receiving a Nobel Prize is obviously the achievement of a lifetime. But it was not until 2007 that Steve Jobs of Apple introduced the iPhone, calling it, quote, a revolutionary and magical product, unquote. What made it revolutionary and magic? It contained a heteroepitaxial layer of silicon on sapphire, a heterojunction made by Infion, a German company, and a technology invented at least in part by Jardes Alfiorov. By this time, heterotransistors were being successfully manufactured in several countries. The country of one of the inventors of the device, Jardes Alfiorov, is not significant on that list. In that sense, Alfiorov's creativity was never fulfilled in his own country. Russia plays today a very small role in the manufacture of transistors. Of the 10 largest semiconductor manufacturers today, five are based in the United States and one each in Taiwan, the Netherlands, the UK, Japan, and Germany, not Russia. The United States dominates the industry with over 50% of worldwide production. One U.S. company, Intel, has twice the annual sales of its nearest competitor, Taiwan Semiconductor. Of course, Russia has some manufacturers of semiconductors, uh, uh, some semiconductor manufacturers. They have to for their military and other uses. They have some semi semiconductor manufacturers. Uh, companies like Angstrom, Eastock, Micron, those are Russian companies making semiconductors, but they are not significant at all in the world market. So, the historical pattern of technical brilliance followed by commercial failure that we have seen in the Soviet Union and in Russia still holds today. Thank you. Places and the bodies? Yes. So because like you, we are talking about creativity and I think, I think it's a very, very important category and I'm going to borrow it from you. I can promise you tomorrow I will talk more to you about creativity, right? But like to, tonight, can you tell us, right, when you talk about creativity, who are these people? Well. And does it matter for your story, right? Well, because, yeah. but, because in your book it matters, right? That's why. So, but I'm, I'm wondering if you like, can explain us who these people are. Who are I, I may not understand the question fully, but I think that the importance of creativity 
in modern society is close to being obvious, that is, and when I say that, I'm talking about in all fields. I'm talking about literature, mathematics, poetry, art, music, and I'm also talking about technology and the importance of technological creativity as a part of our societies is becoming ever more obvious as we talk more and more about knowledge economies. We didn't used to talk about knowledge economies. We talked about agricultural economies. We talked about industrial economies. We talked about extractive economies. And now we talk more and more about knowledge economies. Well, what's a knowledge economy based on? It's based on technological creativity. I'm not sure that's an answer to your question, but it's what. You know, we can keep talking about that. Yeah, we can talk later. Thank you. Yes. My question is, uh, thank you for the brilliant talk. I, I'm also, it's the second time I'm listening to, <laughs> to, your, to your lecture about Russian creativity and I also, uh, each time I continue thinking about uh, the model you propose. And my question is, how can we measure the attitudes to, towards uh, those who invent technologies and those who are writers, artists, and How so can we on? measure what? their popularity, their recognition in the society. Because f how can you, for example, explain the extreme popularity of Korolev as a very iconic figure for contemporary Russian society, who is certainly from the sphere of technology and not from arts and literature? Well, how can we measure the relative creativity of different people, is that what you're saying? No, their popularity and their recognition in the society. Their popularity and, this their, is what and you their recognition. Well, that's what historians are for, mm -hmm. as opposed to sociologists. Uh, there probably isn't any very, I can't think of, well, I mean, you could go and see citation numbers, uh, mentions in the newspapers. Yeah, there are ways. But when I say Tolstoy was a great author, do I have to give you a bunch of statistics? Yes. Um, I'm struck that uh, the kind of story that... that told rang a bell with me because as you can probably tell from my accent I was born in the United Kingdom and when I was a, when I was a child people in the UK used to tell each other a very similar story about Britain's role that mm -hmm. Britain was full of brilliant people but the problem was that their brilliant ideas were never brought out into products and they would cite things like the hovercraft or the the um, TSR2 which was a kind of plane um, and this made me think that there may be a, an interesting comparative story to be told about the roles of these kinds of stories in different nations. So you could take, for example, the UK where this story was told. Back the when the I UK did what? This kind of story about decline and, yeah. and the failure to, to realize creativity. It used to be told very commonly in the UK, and I don't think it is now. Um, and if you take a country like China, it seems like China's almost the opposite case, where there's anxiety because they're very good at actualizing technologies, but the anxiety is that they may not be so good at creating new technologies, new ideas. But the thing, the thing I want to get at is that's, that that's right. in each of these cases, I think the, the perceptions, the attitudes, as you might say, um, generate policies that are designed to try to counteract the problem. So in Britain, there were various bids to try to sort of encourage um, the, the uh, realization of ideas in forms of products. In China now, there's been happening for decades, there have been bids to try to boost um, a kind of, uh, uh, like a pure science mentality, right? Just the idea that you could actually have a, a, a Chinese research creativity culture as well as one that's just applying ideas that come from elsewhere. Uh, so my, my question is, what's the history of the attempt to react to this perception of failure 
That's in a good Russia question. By creating policies that will do that will produce something different. What is the record of the attempts to react to such criticisms and improve the situation? Yeah. Well, in Russia's case. It's all over the place. I mean, they are aware of this problem. And they are setting up all kinds of things, science cities, incubators, science incubators, uh, science cities uh, were devoted to innovation. It's coming from the top down. And so far, the result has been minimal success. China represents the greatest challenge to the writings I have produced. Hmm. Because I have said in my writings that there is a natural congruence between uh, scientific creativity and uh, democracy and good legal system, so forth. But I don't think the bottom line on that is in yet. Uh, there's a book out by Asamoglu and Robinson called uh, Why Nations Fail, and uh, there's a section in there on China. It's, it makes good reading. They're economists at MIT. But they're not like typical economists in that they do use historical examples. Uh, and they think that uh, China will not, under the current government, become a truly creative uh, country, technologically. Uh, it's interesting to note that since 1950, we're talking about 70 years. The only uh, Chinese scientist working in China, notice that last sentence, working in China has won, only one has won a Nobel Prize. And that prize was based upon something she, the woman, she found in traditional Chinese medicine, a valuable product. It's not exactly, it, you know, congratulations to her, but it's not exactly high technology. Uh, so the, in my opinion, and in Asamabu and Robinson's opinion, the final line has not yet been written on China. I would be, if this was a betting place, and I, had, I was forced to place my bets, I'd place my bet that China won't make it under the present kind of government. Can I, um, just a follow-up to that question, sorry, I know other people had their hands up, but um, if you were looking back over the Soviet period, uh, some of the things you were saying reminded me of some of the language in the Great Soviet Encyclopedia, right, about this great tradition of Russian creativity, but under imperialism, um, you yeah. know, scientists weren't able to achieve right. success. The opposite. Right. So, uh, what my question is, was there a moment, or what do you think the moment was during the Soviet period when things were most auspicious for, in, in terms of, you know, actualizing some of the discoveries um, that were made? Would it be the 20s or the thaw or the late 80s or somewhere in between? Um, well, well, I see you taking Alexei your coat Kajepnikov. off. We're trying to get the temperature down here. So Alexei Kozhevnikov left, and I'm sorry he did. Uh, maybe he didn't like what I was saying. But anyway, uh, he, he writes that uh, the Soviet Union was best in uh, science when the repression was the worst. <laughs> but he didn't say the Soviet Union was best in commercial technology when the repression was worst. So in answer to your question, uh, I would say that probably the 1920s, but the 1920s is not a good test. There wasn't much money, and it wasn't a very long period. The kinds of things I'm talking about are durée, <laughs> long periods, 
uh, 10 years is not enough to be a full test of the trends I'm talking about. But in the 20s, there was some real innovation going on. In the 20s, there was a man named Shukov, probably nobody's heard of him, who built and tried to sell during that transistor radios. Tried to sell them. He sold maybe 40 or 50. Uh, you know when transistor radios were first put on the market in the United States? 1950s. 30 years later. So there's a little sign that something might have happened if the 1920s atmosphere had, had continued. But I don't know. Yes? Um, I'm just thinking about, I was also thinking about the 1920s, maybe in um, relation to the, the question that the British man in front had about what kind of um, programs were put into place to change the situation. And the 20s seemed like a period when actually there were a lot of programs that were encouraging innovation and um, the whole campaign for Novu Guites uh, very much kind of reverses that idea that you were talking about, about Russians are good at formulas, but not about into practice. Yes. Um, also, you know, everyone should be an inventor was another big right. I remember thing. That. And it made me start to wonder to what extent can we consider the entire Soviet project really a program to, um, to reverse this trend that so, you uh, are talking we about. We can consider, to what extent can we consider the entire Soviet project yeah. to reverse? Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of it, I guess, Oh, well, yes, like yes, yes. now I'm getting it. Yes, like well, you know, response to that. one of the favorite slogans of Marxism is the union of theory and practice. Right, exactly. Uh, so there was a lot of talk about reversing this trend. You're quite correct. And it was particularly meaningful in the 1920s. And during NEP, I don't have to explain what NEP was to this audience, during NEP, there were two different attitudes toward NEP. One represented by Bukharin to some degree was that NEP is the permanent. We're gonna stay this way and we're gonna be very creative and this is the way the Soviet Union's going to go. And the, there was another group, larger, more effective, more militant, that said that NEP was just a temporary retreat until we can recover from the damage of the Civil War and the war communism and all that. And then we'll go back to a completely state-controlled and planned economy. I don't need to tell you the latter camp won and wiped out those little tiny seedlings that came up in that. My question had to do with the issue of risk. Risk? Yes, and the reason I bring up risk is because, um, so there was this project, uh, I was at the European University when we were engaged with this project that Mario Biagioli and Vincent were leading on um, Computer. Russian computers, right? And um, during a lot of the research that was conducted there, the question of risk came, c kept coming up as a present day problem. In my own interviews, people said things like, well, you know, in the West, people are much more willing to kind of, you know, to bet on you. Uh, in Russia, even Putin himself is, you know, cannot write you a check that the kind of a, a, a middle-range company CEO will happily write for you just for an idea to develop it. Um, so there's there's a lot of this discussion that Russia is extremely risk-averse, risk averse. and that's what tends to preclude this kind of entrepreneurial um, thing. I wonder if you would comment on that yes. because it seems. I think it's a wonderful question. It's not just. To the Russian problem, the question of risk-taking and risk-aversiveness is a, a general problem. But in Russia's particular case, I think that there is a unusual um, aversion to taking risk. But this is one of those problems that 
can't be measured and at least I don't know how to measure it and therefore is elusive and very hard to pin down. You could speculate. You could speculate because there's still a hangover from the time when fulf uh, not fulfilling the plan you got punished. Or there's probably something more generally human about it that transcends all cultures. Is failure a humiliation or is it a learning experience? It's very easy to think that failure is a humiliation. None of us likes to fail. In my life, I've had books turned down. Turned down. Uh, by presses. I have a special enmity toward the Yale University Press. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I've had books turned down. Now, should I be humiliated? Or should I say, hey, you know, let's read that criticism carefully and see if you can improve it a little bit and try again and make, make it better. But it's just an individual problem, right? Because there's also the way risk is structured and spread throughout society, right? Say that again. The risk is structured and spread through society. If you go back, if you undergo bankruptcy in Russia, forget it. You're never going to recover, right? You, yes. If you undergo, I mean, even mortgages have these obscene rates in Russia. So, so I'm really curious about how you know the structures, in the business environment. It's a wonderful question that I'm not fully equipped to answer. I think that a nice book could be written on the topic of how often Thomas Edison failed. He failed many times. Uh, and he didn't quit. Uh, probably a, a, a brilliant sociologist could write a book on that. Maybe it's out there somewhere. If it is, please tell me about it. About a risk, risk aversiveness in different cultures. Is failure something you can learn from and go on and succeed the next time around or maybe the third time around? Uh, remember Apple, Apple is now you know, a very successful computer company. Does anybody remember the Newton computer? <laughs> it was a spectacular failure and Apple put a lot into it. Uh, that's a deep, deep question, and uh, I have some thoughts on it. I've already given you some, but I don't have the answers. I have a little bit of a follow-up on that question and also on the narrativization question that came up earlier. Um, I'm thinking, uh, and speaking of Thomas Edison, I'm thinking of the corollary of Nikola Tesla. Um, who in Serbian culture has actually really been celebrated precisely because his ideas didn't materialize. That's because right. Because they weren't sort of tainted by material gain. And I'm curious if you think that the um, some of the narratives that get created and are told about Russian technologies in fact celebrate or fetishize even the raw potential, the fact that they weren't, you know, they didn't, they're not recognized worldwide, but it started here, um, that kind of narrative. Well. And in fact, if that's the case, is that that different from, is that sort of pure intellect that different from the celebration of the creative arts? During the Soviet period, there was something approaching that, running through the narratives of Russian invention. A common theme was, we Russians, came up when we invented everything you can mention but those nasty capitalists stole our ideas maybe that comes a little close to what you're asking I don't know a celebration of failure uh, in Tesla's case you know the whole story about Tesla maybe some of you know it he was also a very, very politically radical man. And uh, he, 
and uh, his radicalness in, when he was in the United States. And his radicalness didn't help when he tried to get his technical ideas to uh, succeed commercially. And he also came up with some wild ideas that still look wild <laughs> and that have never been applied. Yes? Um, so I want to go back to this kind of questions about institutions, because I think that that- About what? Institutions. institutions. In, the, in the broad, in the why nations fail sort of sense, because right. that hits on risk, that hits on you know, pools of investment capital, that put, hits on governance as a sort of abstract practice. All of those things to me, I find a lot more compelling in explaining the lack of um, technological, bring things to market than a sort of deep-seated Russian cultural thing. Um, I mean, when you were talking about the suspiciousness, it's sort of, I was like, well, so Russian, uh, Russian American writer created John Galt, but the John, there's no actual John Galt's, I don't know, no actual John Galt's in Russia. But I mean, there's really good reasons not to want John Galt's. It's a much more of an American peculiarity that we elect the most, you know, charlatan billionaires <laughs> president, right? And like have this sort of celebration of, of um, the sort of capitalist in like in that way. That's that's more of an oddity of America and culture than it is an oddity of Russian culture. I think. Uh, again, that's a very good question. So let me re respond to it with a question to you. Do you think that Russia could become a thoroughly modern society, competitive technologically, just by getting some different institutions? Yes, but. Wow! <laughs> absolutely, but how do you get those institutions is, is not an easy thing at all. I mean, then so, uh, going back to the, the entire Soviet experiment was trying to get the, institutions that would somehow be doing that in a more equitable way and it was a resounding failure, right? So I don't, so when the question's posed, could you just switch the institutions? Yeah, I think you could. Okay, I think, and I, I mean, and that's where China, I think, is, is giving us food for thought. I leave it there. Okay. Yes. I suppose that my question is the flip side of that coin, assuming institutions do not transform to support this sort of innovation um, what's your hypothesis on what this means moving forward at a time when technolo technology is developing so rapidly, compounding so that we're seeing innovations on a very quick basis introduced into modern society? What do you think, do, will Russia fall further behind or will they continue consuming from other nations what they've developed? Well, it, people often ask me, uh, you know, it's a simple question and I always hate it when I feel it coming. <laughs> Uh, Lauren, what do you think about Russia? What's going to happen? You know, as, as if I, historian of science and technology, know everything about the future of Russia. And uh, I answer, in the short term, and by short term I mean not just two or three years, I mean maybe a generation. In the short term, I'm pessimistic. In the long term, I'm optimistic. I think that Russia has such a tradition of creativity, such a large, well-educated populace, and such close ties to Western Europe, whether it likes them or not, that uh, it will become, I don't think I'll see it, but I think it will become uh, 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 what you might say another European country. That doesn't mean identical to any other country, every other country. Every country has its own traditions and so forth. France is not Great Britain, but another European country. Uh, like a theme here is the Asimoglu and Robinson model that it's really autocracy that is shaping these institutions and deliberately preventing any rival uh, civil society from developing. And uh, an aspect of that seems to be 
like the autocrats win uh, uh, by making themselves uh, superior role models in the public imagination. But even though uh, most Russians uh, talk about Putin as lying about, say, the uh, blowing up of an apartment building in 1999 and so on, that um, his ability to uh, engage in various ruses to keep power uh, make him more popular. Uh, so I wonder whether there's really a, a need for an event that uh, discredits um, the, the autocrats and the... If there is a use? If there's a, if, if what would make a transformation is some event of discrediting. Some um, event of discrediting. Yes. Which, of, of that model. Yes. And then so we what see, would that look like? And we see the opposite of that now as, as the model is spreading, that Trump emulates it. Uh, so, um, um, we well, today that. is not forever. Yeah. So, so, the, so the question really is: is this a, a kind of model of what the best type of human being is? Like, it's not the entrepreneur; it's the dictator. Uh, but that means you don't really believe that. <laughs> well, that's what um, the Russians who uh, well is the Russians. Uh, the Russians are a diverse people. There are all kinds of opponents of Putin in Russia. The Americans are a diverse people. Trump won the election, but he received fewer votes than his opponent. Uh, it's hard to summarize the Russians or the Americans. <coughs> um, I suspect the high poll numbers that uh, Putin is receiving, popularity. I mean, if you are living in your apartment in Moscow and your telephone rings and you don't know who's on the phone and the person phone says, uh, I'm Ivan Ivanov from the Ajax Polling Company, do you support Putin? You say yes and hang up, whatever you think. Uh, and I've had Russians tell me that. I didn't dream that up. Uh, but Putin, we should grant him, has been successful for a while with his model. I think that model is losing steam. And I think that uh, some change is coming. To my great regret, the change might be worse than what we've got. But I still have a belief, and it's not a religious belief, it's a belief built upon doing the same things that you have done, reading lots of books, thinking hard, reflecting on history, I still have a belief that there is a natural congruence between democracy and creativity. It's not absolute, it fails often, but it's there. And therefore, you can guess my answers to your question. In the back row. Um, thank you. Um, do you think the problem of global climate change oh. and like the, the transnational, yeah, the global problem of climate change, does, does that change your hypothesis about democracy, liberal democracy, and technological um, innovation that, you know, needs institutions and collaboration and infrastructure? Well, and where do you see Russia? Yeah. In, you know, in, in those well, I think climate change is a, 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 a enormous threat. It's hard to predict. I'm not very good at predicting history, and I'm skeptical of anyone who says that he is. I can't predict what the results 
of this threat, as it becomes ever more evident, will be. One theory would be, hey, China, Russia, and the United States, we're about to be made extinct, wiped out. Wouldn't it be better to work together against climate change than it would be to squabble with each other? I'd like to think that would happen. Uh, <clears throat> I was just talking about climate change with a man at breakfast this morning, and he took the darkest, darkest of views. He said, <coughs> "We're do essentially." He said, "We're doomed." Uh, I have a more sanguine view of the possibilities if we ever turn our minds to it fully, and when people start dying around us more frequently than they are now, it might get our attention, uh, that it's possible to do something about it. Uh, you all know some of the proposals that have been made. An all-electric economy. All our cars will be electric. All our uh, fuel sources, I mean our energy sources, electricity sources, will be uh, renewable, not easy. Uh, and then possibilities even more dramatic and radical, such as uh, putting things in the sky to partially block the sun. Well, we all worry about that. What are the side effects? What else will happen? But they're now discussing uh, aerosols that will harmlessly disintegrate within uh, 10 years or so, and then if you want more, you have to put up more. Uh, I don't know. I mean, my mind is not able, able to uh, embrace all of that and give you uh, the correct answer. There is, at this point in time, no correct answer. But all is not lost. I, 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 I said that all is not lost over scrambled eggs this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor Graham. I, uh, I want to return to a question that came up in the first couple of questions, which is about Measure, measuring. Ah, uh, here we go with measurement. Um, well, I want to do it, but I want to try to do it from the other way around, and and ask about this category that you're using of creativity. Yes. Because um, I've been I've been troubled by that your references to the Nobel Prize as some kind of measure of great writing, for example. Um, Tolstoy never received the Nobel Prize. He could have. Uh, Bunin did. Alexievich has most recently. You know, I, that's measuring something, but I'm not sure that that's measuring quality. Of, well, I agree with Whether you. it's even important to talk about well, quality. Well, it's important, right? but that, it doesn't mean but we, When we think about artistic creativity or literary creativity is one thing. I wonder whether in science we need a different category, and I, I would propose something like ingenuity. And then it really, they get measured differently. They're really different things, and they affect the world that we live Ingenuity in. Ingenuity is very different, different, different from what? From creativity. Uh -huh. I'm just saying. I, this, the, the parallel between artistic creativity, let's say, and, and scientific ingenuity, I just don't see, I, I guess I'm saying, how it's that productive in the end. Because these are two very different things that have to be measured very, very differently. Even if the Nobel Prize works for scientific ingenuity, innovation, I think it's a terrible measure for literary production. Um, popularity can be uh, can fluctuate. You know, um, there is no stable measure. But if we're going to try to quantify what's happening in the artistic realm, I, I think we we're just looking at a different object very much than if we're looking at what we might quantify in in science. Whether we want to measure that by market value or by Nobel Prize or by the mythic narratives that are constructed by a society. So what would you say about differentiating just the basic concept of creativity into scientific creativity and literary creativity and just disassociating those entirely? All of the distinctions that you make, I agree with. The only thing I don't agree with, and you didn't quite say it, but your argument led there, was so let's give up. 
uh, let's give up talking about the creativity of society in general and only talk about what it does in science and what it does in literature and so forth. Well, you know, the first area studies program was not Russian studies or Chinese studies. It was classical studies. Greek and Roman courses are usually taught as Greek civilization, Roman civilization. And in those courses, they talk about how great literature was produced, poetry, and there were great scientific achievements and even technical achievements. And the Romans are usually given the edge on the technical achievements, and the Greeks are usually given the edge on the, what you might call them, humanities achievements. Is that a senseless conversation? I don't think so. And so I don't think it's senseless for me to make obviously inadequate attempts to measure, measure, to talk about these things together. Uh, there was a time in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century when Europeans said, well, those Americans, they're good at producing reapers and technical things, you know, telegraph, even building buildings and all that, but they don't have high culture. We Europeans have high culture. You can't really say that now. And you couldn't even enter into the conversation about that unless you were willing to talk about the kinds of things I've been talking about. So, yes, it's difficult. The most important things in the world are so difficult that if you argue them, you'll find a critic. Not one critic, but a chorus of them. And you are a very intelligent critic. <laughs> yes. Anybody else? Am I allowed to go again? Oh, yes, please. Okay. Uh, so this is kind of, uh, it's been nagging at me, and that last question brought it back into my mind. Um, so uh, whether there are different kinds of creativity or ingenuity, I, I don't know. Though I do think that it may be that over time, what society take to be the appropriate criteria of, of measurement change, and that that's consequential. But one thing that struck me is that all of your examples were of heroic individuals. Uh, so from from um, you know whoever it was, I forget uh, Tolstoy and Tesla through to, to the guy who invented uh, what gets into cell phones now. But if you look at the the world of uh, research into scientific research for the last, say, couple of generations, one of the things that's been pointed to a lot is something like the collectivization of creativity. So in biomedicine and, and in high energy physics and in things like that, the, that's a good point. the authorship of papers is not individuals. It's like 200 people sometimes exactly. <laughs> with a finely divided uh, ascription of responsibility and credit. And I wonder what difference that makes to your kind of story if we think of, of creativity or ingenuity or whatever you, however you want to conceptualize it as not in terms of individuals but in terms of um, communities, collectives, groups of various kinds that are constantly being reconstituted. Um, well, does, how does that complicate things? Well, it does definitely complicate it, but I would maintain that the more collective the effort is, the more important societal characteristics become. You can always have an outlier. You can always have a Nikola Tesla, who was a rebel in many, many ways. And he was not very dependent on his society. He came up with brilliant ideas. Some of them were, turned out by our current judgments right, and some of them wrong. But it was idiosyncratic and individual. But if you have a development that involves 200 people, and they come from different places, then the role of society, in my opinion, grows. 
you won't get that kind of collaboration without certain societal factors. You won't get a general project. Look at, I subscribe to Science Magazine. I don't know how many people do here. And look at the authors to the scientific articles. And I've subscribed to Science Magazine for probably 30, 40 years. The number of authors to the typical scientific report has grown enormously. It's not at all unusual to see 30 authors. And then I look to see for their institutional and national origins. And they're all over the place. It's a scientist at Caltech in California. It's a scientist in St. Petersburg, Russia. It's a scientist in Birmingham, England, and they're working together. The internet has been a big development here. They're working together. Uh, I've also noticed, and again, I can't give the statistics. It's a very subjective evaluation that the appearance of Russians in those batches of authors is steadily diminishing. It has something to do with, the, in my opinion, everything is in my opinion and therefore vulnerable. But in my opinion, that has to do with the kind of society they are currently living in. There was one more hand, if one last question. If not, then on that note. <laughs> Thank you.